so Dr. Susan Kiefer is the author of Wild Edibles for Survival and First Aid, which a bunch of us bought now. And some might have even bought her other book, Closer to the Sun, a recipe book for health for the next evolutionary phase of mankind, which includes 33 chapters on what happened to our food supply. A lot still happening with that food supply. I didn't think about buying that one, but I guess I'll check it out. <laughs> And how it has purposely changed as well as 200 recipes using food as medicine. Well, I guess I need to go get more money out of my car. She is a master herbalist, master naturalist, iridologist. Did I say that right? Well, everyone says it that way, but it's iridologist. Iridologist. And what is the sclero? Sclerologist. Okay. Is that also the with? The white parts are the scleros, like your name almost. Yes. <laughs> oh wait wait that reminds me of saying don't shoot until you see the whites in their eyes right <laughs> that saying comes in handy a lot right okay sorry i'll get back okay with a passion for health the earth education organic gardening permaculture and wild edibles yes we are going to talk about that permaculture part um, she holds numerous degrees in the fields of biology, animal science, natural healing, raw food culinary classes, as well as a doctorate from the University of Metaphysical Sciences. She wrote her thesis paper on the healing energies of plants. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you. You know what? My son originally did part of this, so but now doing it. But there should be one more line. Oh, well, here. Let's do it again. Oh. There we go. Okay, here you go. All right. <laughs> we had A-B issues, but it's okay. All right. So as she mentioned, um, my passion actually started with the wild edibles. During the years, I, was, um, I started a CSA in Vero Beach, the first one in Indian River County, which if you don't know what that is, it is a community-supported agriculture where we had 70 participating families working on an organic farm. And I wanted it so that they actually had to work and learn how to grow the food, not just, you know, pick up shares every week. And it was family friendly. So we had a children's garden there as well. And because the soil was so rich, which isn't always the case, but there was a lot of wild edibles popping up between the rows. And that's where um, things really started to interest me. Like, well, what are these? Because we were exploring all the time, you know, with the children, they collected all the bugs. Like, you know, let's find out who these are, why they're here, what they're doing. Like we wanted to know everything about the bugs. So then I wanted to know everything about the plants. And then because I'm in Boy Scouts as well, um, I was um, involved for the whole 12 years my son was eligible. He has since moved on, but um, we were camping a lot in the you know, state parks and different locations. And um, there was also a lot of plants and you know, you're spending the whole weekend there. So um, that became an interest too. Like, well, what are these plants? And then of course, even the ones in my backyard. And I have owned so many, if not all of the wild edible books that were available in Florida, a lot of them out of print even. And because of my master herbalist background, I wanted to know more than just, you know, these standard ones. Everyone kind of was going over the same exact ones, um, but they didn't always list most often the medicinal properties as well. And I heard many stories from people who had talked with Native Americans in person. You know, I was once removed, or if not me talking to some of them myself, because I did a lot of wildlife festivals also over the years in all over the state. And um, I kept updating the book and updating the book as people would share and tell me more things that they knew. So what I've compiled today are, I put, I think there's 25 of them. This book contains over 100 plants. I consider all the most important ones to know about in Florida. And there's little maps in there to show you where they're natively growing in the United States. But um, a lot of these are just the backyard ones. They're not like the perfect one that you're, you know, trying to find the elusive mushroom or something like that. Um, these are just right in your backyard or growing on the side of the road. So I put together, I always, when I do my wild edible walks, I like to tell people like, let's pretend, you know, there is no power. 
we have been hit with a EMP or something that has caused all the stores to close. So you can't get your regular medicines from the pharmacy. You can't go to the grocery store for any, you know, store bought food. So what are you going to do? And this is, you know, I'm very much into survival. I, I actually spent a year in Montana in 1995 living with no electricity, no hot water, no phone, um, preparing for a time when we might not have money anymore, believe it or not, which <laughs> is always a rumor floating around about what happens with when finances potentially, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to know what can you eat and what can you depend on if you can't get your medicine. This is important stuff. It's not just like a hobby. I've been studying this for 30 years. So the one that I start with, that I wanted to start with today. There we go. All right, so here's my son. Um, I wanted to include him because he started this PowerPoint over 10 years ago with a few slides and I kind of added to it. But this is, um, yes, that was the height he was at that time. And um, I'm pretty much the same, but then he went to University of Florida, so that's the gator. And, uh, I like to look at him as the little gator on top of me, the big mama gator, but he, he wasn't interested in that photo, but that was a local artist from Gainesville. I have it. Oh yeah, right? Forget his name though, but yeah. I do have the big picture. So yeah, that was his freshman year. And um, since then he has graduated. She must have not wise him. Yeah. Where did you speak? Everything that he ate growing up is in the Closer to the Sun book, my other book. Um, all the recipes we made, which were vegetarian his entire growing up years, except for camp outs with the Boy Scouts. I said, just eat whatever they're eating. Don't, you know, I don't want you to feel weird. So, um, but yes, and he probably wouldn't like me saying this, but as soon as he went to college and he started making his own meals, which he would make something for the whole week, the beginning of the week, which was like, some kind of chicken and rice dish. Um, he immediately broke out in acne that he never had all through teenage years, you know, when all the Boy Scouts were very broken out. He always had pure baby skin until he started eating chicken. So when I researched that, actually it had to do with the antibiotics, which, you know, chicken has in them. And it was bacteria under the surface of the skin that became antibiotic resistant and caused this skin reaction, which was alarming to me. I was like, what did you do? I had you on such a pure diet. But anyway, all the recipes in the Closer to the Sun book, which there's over 200, are all the ones we made growing up, including I made the purple cabbage salad today. Oh, any oh, yeah, that was that's purple cabbage, organic carrots, fresh squeezed orange juice, um, some le fresh squeezed lemon juice, uh, raw local honey, um, cilantro, and cayenne, and golden raisins. And, you know, so it's very fresh and raw, raw food. You know, raw food has all the enzymes. That's actually another talk I offer if anyone wants to learn about food as medicine and why every single ingredient in there has a purpose. It's not always, I mean, I make it so they taste great, but... If it didn't have a benefit, it wouldn't be in there. So um, yeah, so that's him today, as I mentioned. He just graduated in May, actually. And yep, we got him on the gator. If you've never been there, yes. has everyone been there? Yes. All right, you had to get that shot. Okay, so the first plant, and as I mentioned, I picked these plants based on real life <laughs> things that you could depend on in a situation if you had no stores and no medicine. This plant, does everyone, has every, has anyone not seen this plant? <laughs> All right, so I believe it or not, when I do wildlife festivals, I, you know, and even today I was gonna bring a bunch of these plants and put them in water and jars and stuff, but people ask me, oh, you know, at the end of the festival, can I take that plant home? And I, I do appointments because I'm an iridologist. They come to my house. I do photos of the eyes. And that's another subject. But I show them on the way out. I always keep a patch of this and actually a lot of my front yard. Um, but I have a whole butterfly garden, so it blends in. 
but which, by the way, this is also the third most important pollinator plant in the state of Florida. So for people, as we drive around, you know, you see a lot of yards that are just grass and no flowers. And I probably don't need to be telling this group, but um, my yard had plenty of butterflies, bees, and all of that. But um, so yeah, they'll say, can I have, can I take that home? You know, can I, and, and I give them some out of my yard and they carefully wrap it in water and the paper towels. And, um, and I even one year saved all the seeds. I, I made a jar of the seeds just in case for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, I don't know why I collected all the seeds. So people were asking me even for the seeds. <laughs> so I know we get a kick out of that, but I tell people don't always have a patch of this because this is your medicine chest in your yard. This plant is twice as nutritious as spinach. The whole thing is edible. Yes. Are, are all three of those pictures the same thing? Yes. Oh, and it's the beggars. It's either, I like to call it beggar's kick. It's also known as Spanish needles or Biden's pelosa. Okay. The reason it's called beggar's kick is because um, beggars were known to walk along railroad tracks and this plant would stick to them like a tick, you know, so beggar's kick. And Spanish needles is because it stuck to the Spaniards when they first came here. So they kind of brought it over is what the, that's just going to tie up one hand. <laughs> Maybe if I had a, a way to hold this. Anyway, so um, yeah, Spanish needles because the Spaniards brought it over. But it does grow in any climate from Alaska to Florida, from Maine to California. It grows in deserts. It grows it's anywhere. And I consider it the most important plant on the planet. So this one that you're trying to kill all the time and pull out, you know, which I let it go through the cycle until the leaves don't look good. And then I'll pull it out myself. But as long as there's flowers and bees on those flowers, I leave it in my yard. But you, when you would want to eat this, as I mentioned, it's twice as nutritious as spinach, um, and the whole thing is edible. You can put those flowers in your salad. Um, you would want to pick it before it has flowers, though, so only when it's like six inches high or so, you know, the fresh growth, which a lot of these plants are going to be in that category, you know, before they get, even though this is a bitter, which is beneficial, of course, for the liver, and it's actually the taste of the bitter that triggers the liver and stimulates it. So people who are taking bitters, bitter herbs or whatever in capsules thinking you're getting the same benefit, you're not. You need to actually taste it on your tongue to activate your liver. So keep that in mind. So yeah, this plant um, is also one of the most important medicinal plants. And I always tell people, when they're listening to me give a walk or a talk, if you don't remember anything I say, remember this plant. If you don't remember what it's good for, try it for anything. That's how versatile it is. So I'll just give you some examples of what it's good for though. Um, you can use the leaves at the bottom of the plant for sore throats when you chew them. They're good for sore throats. Um, the whole plant is it's the, it's the most powerful antibiotic in a wild edible and more than even um, it's good for MRSA, which we have no cure for right now in the pharmaceutical world. And all the things that superbugs are resistant to because we're eating, well, people are eating animals that are constantly on antibiotics. And so that's causing mutations and superbug strains that will be resistant to antibiotics and eating stronger and stronger ones. In nature, they will never become resistant to the antibiotics in nature because the plants in nature have the whole spectrum of all the compounds working together. They're not just an isolated chemical that they extracted out. And, and that's the part that a superbug can become immune to. I have a great bed and right now they're kind of empty and I have a flower garden. Well, the next year I Well, of course they do come back year after year. So if it's in a pot, I don't know, you know, it'd probably be growing all around the pot <laughs> next year. I, I say just keep a little patch, like a little corner, like rare rabbit, you know, like this. And by the way, rabbits love those needles. I, I had rabbits for many years and I would feed them this plant because people are buying spinach and lettuce to feed their rabbits. 
here it is, you know, here's the best food you can give them. And, but my rabbit would always go for the seeds first. So for whatever reason, it found nutrition first in those seeds. Okay, so um, other things is it's very anti-inflammatory um, and it's antiseptic. So um, just keep in mind, if you like for MRSA, the way you would use it is you would chew a bunch of the leaves, um, pulverize them in your mouth, get your saliva involved, and then put it on the open sore directly, like all chewed up, you know, so it's all juicy for that sore and can get right into like, like I'm saying in a MRSA situation. And then actually being out in direct sunlight activates it even further in that case. You can also um, do the same thing, um, crush the leaves in your hand and just put them all over your skin for mosquito repellent from, and to stop bleeding. The same thing, you would hold it on that area. Um, in nature, the other things, you know, I'm reverting a little bit to Boy Scouts here, but um, the other things in nature that you can use for Band-Aids are things like pine sap, which you may or may not know, um, honey, raw honey. Raw honey is antibacterial. Cooked honey creates bacteria. So when they tell babies, you know, don't eat honey, they're, what they're talking about is cooked honey. But raw honey would be antibacterial and healthy and beneficial. So, um, and then there's another one, which I like to ask the Boy Scouts to participate. Can you think of another Band-Aid in nature, anybody? Um, well, Comfrey is, a, in this book too, by the way, is a bone knitter. And yes, it's a cell proliferant and a, a skin healer. But as far as a Band-Aid to hold something closed. Well, cayenne is um, in this book too. And that is um, a great thing to stop bleeding, yes, as a, in fact, if you were having a heart attack or stroke or hemorrhaging, it stops bleeding in 10 seconds if you put it in your mouth. You know, I have tinctures of it just for those emergency situations. People can just squirt it in and in an instant. And I mean, like less than 10 seconds, which that's another story, but that did happen with my son when he was small. But no, there, this is another one. It's a little tricky. It's in the kind of the insect world. I'll give you that clue. Just to like make you think a little bit. Spider webs, spider webs, which they actually say somehow that it's stronger than steel. I guess if it was the same thickness of, you know, one thread of a spider web. Um, yeah, so spider webs, honey, fine sap. This is a good thing to stop bleeding. Um, there's another plant involved we're gonna get to that's also gonna be good for that. They also use, the Cherokees use this as a worm expellent. Um, the leaf tea, they use the plant juice for eardrops. Um, the flowers are also medicinal. And one of the things that, what to me makes it so important is that it's also good for cancer. It's been found to have anti-leukemic actions. It's studied in research in Taiwan since um, 2001. It also lowers fevers for acute infections. So again, don't always go for a store-bought antibiotic because you're really doing your entire body a huge injustice. Um, not only is there the risk of the um, resistance, but you're also gonna destroy your microflora and your, and your gut. So here's something you can try. And, and all the recipes in my food is medicine book also will help knock out fevers and bacterial infections and all that without even needing to do this really. So um, other things that it's good for is for benign hyperprostate hypertrophy. If your prostate is inflamed, um, it helps decrease irritability in the membranes. It's good for candida, herpes one and two, malaria. It's an anti-venom plant for poisonous snake bites. It protects against neurotoxins. You can use the plant sap applied to burns even. Um, it's good for whooping cough. And um, diabetes is another one, a big one, that um, has been shown to lower glucose levels and increased sensitivity of insulin receptors. So in my pharmacy survival talk, what I'm saying is people, who, a lot of people are dependent on insulin. And imagine the world if, like I said, power stopped and you couldn't go to stores. 
not only for insulin, but um, all those people who are addicted to coffee and meeting caffeine, you know, can you just imagine, even if it was for a week that we lost abilities to for people to access coffee, a lot of people have that saying, you know, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee. And that's really a drug addiction. And so that would be a bunch of people going mentally berserk, um, you know, just from lack of coffee. But even if they couldn't get cigarettes, even if they couldn't get alcohol, I mean, just think of all the addictions people have that if they couldn't get that and you're trying to, you know, we have a hurricane, let's just say, wipes out power for a, a long length of time. Um, so really you want to clean your body out before you get to that stage. So you're not addicted to anything that, you know, a lot of people even are addicted to meat where to switch to vegetarian diet, they're going to go through a detox process, which is going to make them feel awful. And that's when they say, Oh, I felt better eating that, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And so just imagine, you know, if we had situations where you couldn't get the things you're addicted to. Um, it's, it's important to be clean on the inside so that you're pure already. You've already gone through the detox and you know, you're not going to be affected if something like that happened. And yes, you can eat this, as I mentioned, um, in your salad. And, um, it even protects against radiation protection for bone marrow. So, just know you can eat this plant. You can eat it raw. Not everything you can eat raw, but this one you can. You can juice it. You can put it in a blender. You know, people are always buying spinach and kale and making smoothies. You can stick this in your blender. Can you cook it? You can cook it. I did make a grilled cheese once using this as the thing in it. Um, you can put it in soup, of course. Um, again, you know, before it gets flour, this is better, but you can add the flowers to salads. And by the way, in this book, there's a whole wild well, um, edible flower section too in the back. All right, so let's move on. But I just want to stress, this is number one highlighted plant for this whole talk. <coughs> so I guess these are my son's graphics. I did not have any when I was making it. I didn't know that... Uh, I guess if there was sound, I think there would be a squishing sound. <laughs> I left some of his in there. This is one of them, the original one he did. Dandelions is another one that um, historically Native Americans relied on, and it grows all over the world, as you can see. Um, this plant, the Latin name is Taraxacum officinale, which means the official remedy for all illnesses. So that's pretty powerful to have that be your Latin name as a plant. Um, this one is also a bitter and um, the flowers are also edible. People do use the roots for coffee, um, but the leaves are, I consider them the most nutritious green leaf you wanna put in your juicer, in your smoothie recipe, um, more than kale, more than spinach. So, you know, if you're not familiar, they sell dandelion leaves in the store that are about this big. They're very easy to grow in Florida. Has anyone not seen those? You're not familiar. Fresh Market has them. Sometimes Publix has them, which is actually surprising because they didn't always have organic food choices like that. But um, definitely Fresh Market always has it. And um, Dandelion is insanely high in vitamins. Um, the only part that's not edible is the hollow flower stem, but even the, um, the milky sap in there is considered something you could use for glue in the wild. So um, another plant most people are trying to kill, which is why it takes so much poisonous weed killers to destroy it because that's how nutritious they are and how resistant they are to disease. Um, also really, really good for your liver. Somebody told my daughter to make a tincture of dandelion, which is dandelion in vodka. <laughs> yeah, I'm a master herbalist. Um, my, my herbs are in tincture form um, for the most part because tinctures the difference between a tea, a capsule, and a tablet, or a tincture, 
is capsules and tablets are the least effective way to take herbs. Um, you hardly absorb any of the medicinal properties of them. Teas are the second most effective way because at least you're heating it up 212 degrees and it's that boiling water that it's steeping in that extracts a broad range of the medicinal properties, but alcohol extracts the greatest amount of medicinal properties. But then what I recommend people do is to take, and my, I usually say do a teaspoon twice a day in a shot glass of water, but I say leave that shot glass out on the counter for 12 hours so the alcohol can evaporate out before you drink it. It's not that it's terrible to have it in there because for years I did it with them, but um, that's how you can easily get it out. You can also put a teaspoon in a hot cup of water and it will instantly evaporate out. Um, but I do rec but without the alcohol, the tinctures would not would only last three days. So it's also a preservative for it. It doesn't need refrigeration that way. They can last, you know. Is it a good alcohol or? Well, the higher um, percent, the better. Like if it was 100%, that would be the. So vodka or something like that? Yeah, vodka or grain alcohol, even, which I personally don't use grain alcohol, but. Um, and we are going to talk oh, about T I N C T U R E. Yeah, I I have over fifty herbal formulas, which are also in that closer to the sun book, and um, more than they're in um, blends, like are specific for the liver, specific for the heart, specific for the kidney. Um, which in most stores, all you'll find is like a single ingredient, and mine are four times the concentration and probably half the price of that one single. So they're very rare the way I do mine, but mine are very powerful. In October not to drink it, so I found out about it. <laughs> oh. Can you just drop it in your tea? tea? Yeah, you can put, and that's another thing. Most people only take dropper bowls and it's just not nearly enough. You need to like slam it home. <laughs> like if you're, if you've got like um, an illness where you're, You've got a sore throat, you can feel yourself getting run down, you might even have a cough. You know, you should be doing like three teaspoons, like I have a respiratory formula, three teaspoons like every two or three hours in the shot glass of water. And and mine, that particular one is pretty famous for knocking out that cold, that sore throat, that cough within like two days, where people are usually going for antibiotics that don't work. I've even had the judge in the Port of Bureau using mine. But um, that's what people should have been using during COVID, really. I have a question. How long does that last? Can you like buy it and stick it in your medicine cabinet and then when you do feel a cold coming out of the table? Oh, yeah, they last well over 10 years. Oh, wow. They said they found some with King Tut that are still viable. I grew up up north and we lived downwind of a seed company. We used to have vandalized all over the yard. We were always trying to get rid of them. My mom would be out there picking them up. Nobody in the family would eat it. Well, yeah, and but they're really actually better raw. I mean, raw food is another thing I teach, um, and the benefits of keeping the living enzyme that you're going to use because we're born with a limited quantity of enzymes. So if you're always eating cooked food every single meal, you're rapidly going through your enzymes and your, your digestive juices, whereas if you eat the plants with their own enzymes, you won't have to use yours. It'll be much easier for your digestion. So raw dandelions in the, in juices, like I'm saying like if you get a juicer, like a Breville juicer, um, juice the dandelion. I have like a really good liver cleansing recipe in there involving beets, carrots, dandelion, um, ginger, lemon, and a red apple and um, like a cucumber. That is very specific for flushing your liver and getting it out of the body. And it's delicious, absolutely delicious. But you need something strong and bitter like the dandelion. Um, so yeah, of course people, they always talk about, you know, dipping the dandelion flowers in batter and frying them. But just so you know, anytime you're heating oils and frying anything, your liver hates that. It is the most damaging thing you could do for your liver. Um, and even pickling, to be honest, is as bad as alcohol. The liver hates fermented food like kombucha, apple cider vinegar, any vinegar, um, fermented anything, you know, even pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi, all those things people are saying are healthy. 
your liver actually hates it, hates it. It pickles the liver too. So, um, so the best way is raw, raw, but you know, I actually recommend if you ever were to have an appointment with me, um, I give people a 30 day liquid reset diet to go on. And you're, what you're doing is putting everything in the blender. You're getting all the fiber, but you're not chewing and chewing and chewing. The blender becomes your stomach. So if you don't want to like chew, chew, chew all this like salad stuff, put it in your blender and just make a V8. And it's much easier to just drink it down. Um, so especially the, the dandelion, you don't want to destroy that by frying it, heating it, coating it, cooking it, baking it. I mean, it's some of these you have to do that with, but like if you want the, the dandelion coffee with the roots, of course, you're going to have to roast those roots. Um, but here's the dandelion meal, just to tell you all the, all the ways you can, you can make dandelion. You can have um, serve a light and refreshing mild dandelion wine, which is a famous thing, you know, or great grandparents regularly consume the dandelion wine. And I do explain in here how to make that wine. Um, or there's also a healthy non-alcoholic drink you can make with the dandelion. So you can add the juice um, while eating. In this case, this is a quote from one of the dandelion recipe books, but he says, serve light and refreshing mild dandelion wine or the healthful refreshing juice while eating dandelion flour fritter appetizers followed by a healthy dandelion green salad cover boiled dandelion flour heads with melted cheese and eat as a vegetable or add some shredded dandelion leaves to scrambled eggs to amp up the nutritional content and energy value the roots can be boiled and eaten like carrots use the medium size but fat roots for the best taste and finish the meal with dandelion coffee so there you go you can live on dandelion maybe I mean, you really could. If you were like starving on a deserted island, you know, and you're like looking for what can you eat? I mean, I don't think a deserted island is gonna actually have dandelion. Um, I'm just saying when, if you do a fast for three days or even five days, which I don't recommend water fast, but let's just say you were in a situation where, you know, you just had to live on water for a period of days. At the end of that time, a leaf of lettuce is going to taste like the most excellent, delicious thing you've ever had. You're, you will be like so amazed at how great an apple slice tastes because you've got to like reset your taste buds and, and appreciate the food again, instead of just piling it on, piling it on where you're just like, you know, you don't, you're, but if you fast, that's, that's the reaction your body and your mouth would have. You would be so appreciative. So doing like a reset, liquid diet, like I was saying, um, it gets you feeling how you're really supposed to feel. How long has it been known that dandelions are nutritional value? And if it's a long, long time, what happened with that culture and why wasn't it shared? Okay, so dandelions are thought to have originated in Greece and been brought over to America with the Vikings in 1000 AD. Um, you know, there's books like, um, the Foxfire series, and I don't know if it's mentioned in A Land Remembered, but um, it's been known for forever, as far as I'm, the Native Americans, for sure, knew about it. And they were, uh, they were around 10,000 years. Before. There's plenty of people that... training in school that you get, you know, in high school, you got the trainings on cooking and stuff like that. How do they get bypassed? Okay, well, here's how. Because of the AMA. Yeah. <laughs> The American Medical Association came on board and they started burning all the witches and drowning them who were teaching this wild edible nutritional medicine. They got rid of the midwives and the women who had a lot of the knowledge, but also the Native Americans they destroyed. So it was a definite um, plan to knock out nutrition, and which is also what that book is about, is how they changed the food supply and why they did that. But even though they, they did that with getting rid of it as general information, there was always people who knew about it and always educated and 
you know, the, the information might have went underground, but it, there's definitely. So this book, a lot of this book is about bringing this information back to light that, um, I mean, this book has a lot of history of where things, how they were used and by who um, that were like, I had to, it was a scavenger hunt getting all this from all the different sources I did, but it was going to be lost information as far as I'm concerned. So this one's pretty basic, but um, yeah, there's a lot in here that um, is not, was not known. And, and like I said, the books were out of print and they, you couldn't even find them, but um, so yeah, you can also make dandelion coffee, ice cream, dandelion meringue pie, dandelion beer, dandelion flour cookies, jelly and muffins. And there's recipes in the back of this book for how to do a bunch of that stuff. But medicinally, dandelion root is very good as a blood purifier, a diuretic for the kidneys. Um, for 5,000 years, dandelion parts have been used to clear fevers, break up congestion, stimulate milk flow in nursing mothers. It can rejuvenate the damage of an alcoholic's liver. It's very beneficial to the liver to clear obstructions and detoxify it. The bitter root is used to stimulate appetite, treat anorexia, improve digestive juices, bitter, 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 you know, what everyone wants, sugar, sugar, sugar. One more question. So is this information being related to the medical history? The American Metal Association I was pre-med in college, but they didn't even teach nutrition. They don't. They have one hour of nutrition required to get their MD. That's it. One hour. And I have nurses and doctors, mostly nurses, who come to me and they want to learn this, but also doctors. They're saying they want to, you know, they're interested in this and they know it's like taboo. I mean, you can lose your medical license. For telling someone this, if you are a doctor, for sure, if they, they have to practice in Mexico or get out of the country, or they will lose their medical license. Because I have a lot of treatments in here on how you can naturally treat cancer. And that is absolutely illegal and forbidden. You know, so you're not going to hear this in the medical world whatsoever. And there's a whole, you know, but I'm not saying that medicine is all bad. I mean, but what I'm saying is figure out what you can do first using food as medicine, using herbal formulas. If they don't work as a last resort, then go to medicine. But a lot of medicine is really designed to replace function in the body. And once you do that, it's only going to get weaker and less effective. The body's going to say, well, you don't need me anymore. You're in this. And every drug is to the liver and everything has side effects. And they all came from plants to begin with. They were all patented by isolating some form of a plant, but they can never patent the whole plant. For instance, there's a plant in here called graviola, which is also known as soursop. That plant yes. is 10,000 times more chemotherapeutic than the strongest chemotherapy drugs. And they tried for 40 years to patent that plant and they just could not find a way to replicate it in their studies but they saw how powerful it was with none of the side effects. So they finally gave up. And then one of their research whistleblowers leaked the information out about how valuable and potent that plan is. So that's in here, gravioli. I actually have that. And many of you might have it in your, in your yards. I got three. Yeah, so keep that plant around so that you have the leaves for cancer. Uh, graviola or soursop. It's like got a big fruit, like almost the size of a jackfruit. It grows in the Amazon. It's a giant tree. So far, I'm like, oh, this fruit. Yeah. Fruit is called guar, but not. Yes. I, you know that sound me see strong, manamanama. You know that song, whatever. You can buy it. Manamanama. Chiquita yeah. makes the pulp in uh, plastic little things that you can get from either BJ's or I think Publix still has it. Put it in your smoothies, you'll feel fantastic. What is it? Water banana. Or, or sour, sour sauce. Yeah. But it says water banana on the top. Yeah, and I, I have that word in here too. Wow. Yeah, yeah. G U A N A. Yeah. -A -A. Uh -huh. Wabana. Wabana. Um, okay, so 
Again, if you need glue, well, you can use the sap in the uh, salt of the dandelion. Okay, so Caesar weed. Caesar weed is also a plant I consider one of the most important plants to know about, um, which is also called goosefoot because, as you can see, the leaves look like a goose's foot. Has anyone not seen this plant? I was going to bring this today because I have plenty in my yard, but it has those little burrs that stick to you if you're walking through any native thing. Those little burrs they stick to your cat's fur if you have your dog. Okay, Caesar weed. So Caesar weed is also very important because for three reasons. Um, first of all, that is also edible, which they say is edible raw, but I really don't recommend it because even if you, and anything in here that says it's edible raw, I definitely recommend taking a tiny piece of it first and tasting it because some of them have these really fine hairs or just that they cause a little irritation in your throat. So do not eat a whole leaf by any means, especially this one. So even though it says it's edible raw, it, it always irritates my throat. So um, you can cook this one in that case or juice it, juicing or putting it in the blender. But um, Caesar weed is a cousin of the marshmallow plant, which really doesn't grow well in Florida. But the marshmallow plant is in, in this book, I have a section called the 10 and I actually added 14, so I wrote the 10 or 14 most important plants to plant in your garden, which marshmallow is one of them, because if you ever had gangrene, um, and again, we're in our survival world where people just want to cut your leg or your foot off. Um, if you were to make a marshmallow leaf tea, or the root actually, marshmallow root tea, you could, with cayenne added to it as well, um, soak your, let's say it was your foot, you have to actually create an opening so the tea can get into, the, let's say your foot is purple, you know, dang green, um, and there, but there's no opening. In order to create an opening so the tea can get inside your body, um, one of the best ways is to take a raw clove of garlic and you apply it to the skin and it causes like a little burning sensation and, and you know, um, the word for that. But um, what'd you say? No, there's a word for that process. Um, but anyway, that's good enough to open your skin so that it can get inside. You can also do that for toothaches, by the way. Put a raw clove of garlic on in between your teeth. Um, and some of these plants are good for toothaches as well. But um, so you would soak your foot, let's say, in this tea. Um, and supposedly, okay, a lot of this stuff I get to test, but I have not tested this one, but it's been known for decades by famous herbalists that it would pull out the gangrene out of your body um, in 24 to 48 hours, as long as it has a way out because the marshmallow tea combined with the cayenne, which is a stimulant and makes everything act better, it's a catalyst um, and you know helps with circulation. So, Caesar weed is in the family. So I'm just saying in your survival world, marshmallow just seems too delicate to do well in Florida. I think the leaves are just too thin or something, but um, has anyone seen the marshmallow plant in Florida? In, when we first moved here in the 70s, they were all over the place. In like Brevard area? Uh, in route, more in the marshlands going toward Orlando. Yeah, the, a lot of plants that don't do well in our area, I see them in the Northwest Florida. They are in Florida, but they're just, they need a little bit colder climate. And that's definitely one of them, but maybe, well, you know, the climate that um, the, the zones have been creeping up, you know, so maybe back then it was, the zones were a little further south. But I would use this marshmallow root, I'm just saying, if you had gangrene, <laughs> if you didn't have the marshmallow plant, I would try this, but it's also good for candida. It's also good for kidney failure, lung congestion, diabetes again, and cancer. And they actually did a study with rats who were diabetic and hypoglycemic. And they found that within four to six weeks, the blood glucose concentrations of the treated diabetic rats became indistinguishable from that of non-diabetic rats. But keep in mind, 
if you are someone dealing with diabetes, you, like let's say these rats, you know, you also cannot eat the foods causing the diabetes and expect to get these results. So you have to, which is, you know, sugar. And I'm not saying fruit. Fruit is actually the beneficial glucose that we need. Um, if any of you are scientists, you remember the Krebs cycle in science, it starts with a glucose molecule and ends in ATP energy. It does not start with a protein molecule. So our brains run almost 100% on glucose, as do our pancreas and as does our liver. So um, every day I tell people have a fruit smoothie every single morning if you want your brain to get the energy it's going to need, um, which so many people are addicted to coffee and caffeine. I mean, even 10 year olds, you know, with their monster drinks or whatever, um, really they need a fruit smoothie is what I'm trying to say. You start your day with that at the end of the day when people are fatigued, mentally exhausted, drained, don't have your glass of wine thinking you're doing your body any benefit. Have a fruit smoothie and you're going to feel like a clean refreshment occur in your brains. <laughs> so this is like the food is medicine stuff that's in my book. Just to remind you, though, because that's so important. And, and when I do the eye pictures, I can see in there if you're deficient in glucose, if your brain isn't getting enough glucose, it, it absolutely shows in the eye pictures. Um, okay, and caffeine, by the way, is not the thing that stimulates your body to wake up. It is um, what it's doing is it, it sends a signal to your adrenal glands to secrete or excrete um, adrenaline. And it's the adrenaline that's causing you to be like, you're running on adrenaline, which is poisonous. Um, it's only supposed to be fight or flight for emergencies. But inside the body, the liver still has to absorb all that adrenaline back into it because it's not supposed to just always be in your blood supply. So keep that in mind. Fruit smoothie, fruit smoothie. Here's another one. If you put, start your day with um, a glass of water, like, you know, bigger than eight ounces, like 12 ounces or so. Squeeze a fresh lemon, a whole lemon in there, fresh squeeze, you know, with a lemon press. Um, drizzle in like maybe even up to a tablespoon or just under a tablespoon of raw honey, which is also in this book, I have a whole thing about bees and their products and how we could live on the bee products, bee pollen, the honey. Um, and then add um, a whole bunch of, you have to work up to this, but sprinkle a bunch of cayenne on it, in it. Um, and then, you know, the more you can take, you should actually, a goal would be three teaspoons of cayenne every day. So it's recommended to start out with a quarter teaspoon. If you were doing this in a fast way, you would do a quarter teaspoon for three days, then add another quarter teaspoon. But I'm just, I just like sprinkle it on. And now I'm up to three shakes on my thing. But, and then I added one drop of ginger oil, which you'd have to get an edible, you know, doTERRA or Young Living version. But um, stir that up and drink that as your coffee in the morning and then have a fruit smoothie after that. But what that's going to do is all that cayenne, you're going to feel it spreading your circulation all over the place into your brain. Um, it's going to heat you up, like get things working, you know, like turn on the lights in the store, open saying you're open for business to your body and um, the lemon rinses your liver off of all the toxic stuff it was um, getting rid of overnight so every night you should flush your liver with this fresh squeezed lemon juice but add the cayenne and um, you're going to get your wake up <laughs> Cinnamon, you can add it to it, but there's no way it is nearly as powerful. Not, but cinnamon is good for um, the pancreas, for sure, for blood glucose, absolutely. But cayenne is the second most important part herb. Um, it's, it's in this book, as I mentioned, it's in both books. There's so many things that it does. I recently read that some of the brand I just, I might have, but what I remember most about cinnamon is the um, diabetic stuff and how it's great for the pancreas and blood glucose. What else is good for anti-inflammatory? Well, marshmallow, that's what that's known for. 
Um, so I have a herbal formula for inflammation, which has marshmallow in it and astragalus. And um, instead of prednisone or those kind of things, you have to like take, you know, three teaspoons every couple hours because herbs are not as like people want instant. They do give you really good results with the cayenne, let me tell you that. But um, it, it would take like a day or two that you would notice it, but you could hammer it, hammer it, hammer it. People who say herbs don't work, they're not taking enough. They're not taking it often enough and they're not taking it strong enough. Yeah, I've noticed that even the herbs that you get out there, they give you a fraction of what you actually need in capsules and stuff in itself. Yeah, keep in mind capsules and towels are the least effective way. But um, I do have over 50 formulas. And if you ever want more on that kind of a talk, I'm happy to explain that one. But all right, let's move on to um, so. Pine trees, um, every pine tree is edible and almost every part of the pine tree is, is edible. So I don't know if many of you knew, but when the um, pilgrims first landed in on Plymouth Rock, um, you know, at that time, the Native Americans didn't see them as a threat and they were helpful in helping them survive their winters. Um, one of the things that the Native Americans relied on to survive the winter was eating the bark, the inner bark of the pine tree called the Kangian layer. Um, and even though this one doesn't look like a pine tree, I just put it in there because it's showing you clearly where that layer is. And there's a pine cone in there, but I really don't know any pine tree that has white bark like that. That looks like an aspen or something. But um, so if you're going to do this with the pine bark, you have to cut out a square. Because if you were to go all the way around the circumference of the tree, you would kill it because this is how the sap is running up and down the tree. And the best time to do this is in the spring when the sap is running from the roots up. And then it's very sweet. You can eat it raw, they say. I, I have tried to get this bark, but I haven't. I don't think I've actually been successful. I mean, I only tried like once or twice, but um, you know, people like Boy Scouts, you know, they hear this and they need want to find out what it tastes like. So we have tried, but um, you can also what the Native Americans would do is they would cut it into little strips. They you know just patch and eat it like raw spaghetti, or um, to survive the winter. They would make it into, um, they would pound it into cakes and then they would dig a hole and put like heated rocks and like a, kind of make an oven in the ground and put layers of these cakes of this pine wood um, in between layers of leaves and several of them and they would get them very black and dry, like they would burn them basically. But then that would be the way they preserved them all winter long. And then just before they were ready to eat them, they would soak them in boiling water to make them soft. And this was plenty of food for them um, in a survival situation. Just keep this in mind. This is how they taught the pilgrims to survive their first winter. Um, let me go to here. So um, one pound of this inner bark or cambium is equal to nine cups of milk in nutrition which I don't recommend dairy, but just to give you an example. Um, yeah, colonists arriving on the shores of an unknown land learned early to gather this leathery inner bark in the springtime, dry it through that throughout the summer and then grind it or mix it with regular flour next to devouring it raw. The easiest way to eat this sweet cambium is to cut it into strips and cook it like spaghetti. Um, the sap-filled inner layer was so frequently employed as an emergency food and for a flower that great stands of these trees were found stripped of their bark by early explorers in North America. And again, make sure you, even with Lewis and Clark, when Sacagawea was helping them, you know, get across the country, and they didn't know what to eat, but she knew what to eat. And so as soon as they started seeing pine trees with these these patches taken out of them, she started to get excited and say, oh, we must be getting near where my people are, the Shoshone tribe. And Lewis wrote in his journal, they were probably starving. Why else would they eat the wood of a tree, he wrote. 
but um, she recognized that this is how, you know, that was a regular thing that they did. The needles, the pine needles, if you've ever chewed on a pine needle, um, they're very lemony, very sour. They have five times the amount of lemon as vitamin, five times the amount of vitamin C as an equal amount of lemons, which is why people make pine needle tea. Like all those people coming across having scurvy, you know, if they knew this is one of the ways they get themselves back to health is eating, drinking the pine needle tea. And if you ever have a cold, that's a great thing to do as well. Um, the male pine cones, which is this fleshy looking thing over here, are very high in um, testosterone. And that, if you shake it when it's first, it's only out for a couple of weeks, um, but when you shake it, it has this pollen attached to it that you would want to put like a bag over it to collect it and shake the bag. But that pollen is very nutritious. And the Native Americans used to eat it before battles by putting it under their tongue to get a boost of testosterone. So they actually sell, you'll see it like on Amazon, it's called like male or fine pollen testosterone. I mean, they sell it in like a tincture form, I think I've seen it um, to, for people wanting more testosterone. So um, you can also, the pine cone, of course, is a female, has pine meat, pine nuts in it, um, which you have to get them before the squirrels do. So you have to make sure you're watching those pine cones before they open. You have to be the first one to get it. And what the Native Americans would do is they would like put them near the fire, like on the outside, and they would pop open like popcorn kernels, basically. And then you can dig them out like how with a walnut scraper, nut scraper, and they're very delicious. I mean, they sell them in the store, you know, that's what's in pesto sauce, pine nuts, basil, olive oil, garlic. Um, but the Western pine trees have the biggest pine nuts. So they, they all have pine nuts, but only the female cones, but um, not every tree has the same size. So yeah, I have to beat the squirrels to them. But they are definitely delicious. So the pine tree, also has a medicinal pine sap, as I mentioned, um, which is part of a cancer salve. It's called black ointment and it's made with pine tar. Um, also the pine sap is antibacterial, as I mentioned, using that for your Band-Aid. Um, the monemones applied the pounded inner bark as a poultice to cut sores and wounds as a kind of Band-Aid also. The pitchy tar can be applied to burns and cuts, um, as well as the soft inner bark. The pine sap mixed with honey makes cough syrup, and it is the tannin in the bark that is the medicinal ingredient in the cough syrup. So um, just keep that in mind. We've got plenty of pine trees. Every pine, and the Australian pine tree is not a pine tree, I'm sure you know, but you can get the water out of those branches and drink it and it's pure water. So if you needed water, which this book also talks about how to find water, um, you can like cut the branch and drink it right off the tree. So it contains potable water, the Australian pine tree, but that's the only good thing about it. I mean, other than yes, you can make a bed out of those needles. All right, let's move along. What about the North Fork pine? Oh, and pine needle tea they were using for this COVID stuff to help with the white protein as an antidote. What did you say? What about the normal pine? Is that Florida? Yeah. It says every pine tree. That's not a pine. That's oh. A, that's not a pine. Okay. Tree, so yeah. She's saying that's not a pine. Okay. All right. Let's go on. So I'm giving you the most important ones that people were actually relying on. Um, cat tails. Of course, is another one. Almost every part of the cattail is edible at different times of the year. So um, the Native Americans absolutely relied on cattails. Inside that um, flower head, which is, we used to call them punks. I don't know if anyone else did. Like in New Jersey, they would, punks. Um, you could light them, you know, and they'd be like a torch for you. That part is not edible, but you can use that for stuffing first, anything. But um, before it gets to that stage, it's a green, thin stalk. 
that's hidden inside the leaves. Like you have to feel for it, you can't see it, but you can eat that like a corn on the cob, raw. And um, supposed to be very tasty. Um, at the base of the cattail, and, if, and again, you have to be careful with cattails, make sure they're not growing in polluted water or um, any water plants, make sure they're not growing in polluted water. And um, it's at the base, there's three other plants that look identical before it gets that flower head, which two of them are poisonous, which is the iris family and um, blue flag, but sweet flag also looks like it, but that's not poisonous. But an acre of cattails produces 10 times as much food as an acre of potatoes. Um, yeah, so in the book, there's a ton of information about all the different ways to harvest, like at the base of the cattail, on that right top right picture, that's all the, um, about a foot of the base. You chew it from the bottom up, and then as soon as it starts getting too tough, then you stop, but it's like, you know, asparagus, kind of, in fact, I think it's called Cossack asparagus. Yes, from um, in Russia, they have this also, and they called it Cossack asparagus, but it's eaten everywhere in the world. Um, the pollen from the cattail flower also can be used as a cereal, very high in protein. You can use it if you cut it with um, regular flour, a half and a half or a third and third, they make cattail cakes and cookies and all kinds of energy foods with that. Um, and then the rhizomes and the roots are also edible. You can also use the starch of the roots for a soothing effect for poison ivy and burns. Um, they can, the boiled and cooled, there's these things called corn bases, which I don't think that's up there. But you can use that for um, infections, bee stings. The Native Americans made a jelly-like poultice by pounding the roots and applied this to wounds, sores, boils, carbuncles, inflammation, burns, and scalds. And it's also antiseptic. It, it can be numbing for your toothache. If you there's a sticky substance at the base of each green leaf that. It makes you feel a little numb and it's antiseptic. They would use that on cuts, abrasions, and for toothaches to deaden the pain. So there's a bunch of medicinal properties as well. Okay, so acorns, another um, big crop in the world, which there's a difference between the red oaks and the live oaks. You know, the red, the red oaks have the pointy leaves and the white oaks have the rounded leaves like our live oak. But one handful of acorns is equal in nutrition to a pound of fresh hamburger. And um, more acorns have been eaten by people than both wheat and rice combined in the history of mankind. There are lots of um, acorn recipes in here. You can make veggie burgers, um, nut milk, even out of acorn, you can make a coffee substitute, you can make griddle cakes, acorn tortillas, acorn bread, acorn muffins, acorn pancakes, and I have a bunch of recipes in the back of the book. The tannins, the difference between the red and the white is the reds have more tannins in them, which you want to get out before you would eat the acorn because it's toxic to us. But you can save that rinsing, which it has to be in moving water, like the Indians would put it in a basket in a cold st moving stream. And that's how they would wait until all the tannins were out of the acorns by rinsing it. Since we don't typically live near a moving stream, you can use like a running hose or faucet if you want to do it that way. You can also boil it out. So once you start boiling anything, you lose a whole bunch of nutrition and it turns in a different consistency. Um, but the tannic water, you can even use that to clean your laundry list. It's very antiseptic. And actually, if you dilute it, it's also um, medicinal for infections. And um, it's also antiviral. It can be used to wash the skin for rashes, burns, small cuts, bee stings, acne, to treat hemorrhoids, 
If you freeze the tannic water in ice cube trays, you can use it to rub on poison ivy blisters to reduce itching, often cured in three days. The Native Americans use the inner bark to cure diarrhea. The white oak bark is a famous um, herbal thing that people use a powder and they stuff it up around their gums to help tighten the gums because it's astringent. So if anybody's teeth are getting loose, Consider if I have a tooth powder, for instance, with white oak bark that you just shove up in your, and you can even talk with it. No one even knows it's there, but it's tightening your gums the whole time. Um, so yes, there's even acorn pudding. So that was a, a major thing that most people in the world do. This is one of the fun ones that if you're out in nature, it's very fun to eat this one. Smila family, it has, um, where the new growth is at the end of the line, you can snap that off like asparagus and it's very tender and it tastes like asparagus. Like in the meat world, they say everything tastes like chicken. In the plant world, everything either tastes like asparagus or green beans is the other one. But the boys have to love eating that. And then the root, and this is like many names and you see this plant in many forms like cat briar, you know, it's got the thorns on it. A divine, um, but it has this red root, like a sweet potato looking thing. It's called, um, known as red punti. And when William Bartram, which if you haven't heard of him, he was one of the first explorers exploring all the plants in this country for the King of England. And his trail starts in Sebastian. We have this sign. That sign is literally in the river, river, let's get this mixed up, Riverview Park. Um, and it, it ends, I think, in Georgia, which I've been at the other end of it too. But um, when he first, and I have the trail he was on there. But um, when he was first, he was with Native Americans. I, again, they used to be friendly because they didn't see anyone as a threat. And they were showing them what they were eating. And they were making root beer, you know, out of that, literally out of a root. Um, they were also, they were eating them like sweet potatoes or potatoes. Um, and they would make, they would ground it up and make um, like a meal, a flour, M-E-A-L, like a flour meal out of it and combine it with bear grease. And um, I believe it was honey. Let me just get to that. My last. So these plants are alphabetical in the book. I did. I was going to make them alphabetical on the thing here, but I kind of went in the order how I wanted to talk about them. But yeah, they would. Um, the Native Americans, when the roots are ten, when the leaves are ten, young and tender, they would harvest them in the root, cook them, and eat them like a starchy potato. According to William Bartram, they would chop them up, pound them into a mortar, mix them in water and strain them. The sediment dried into a fine reddish meal, mix in a small amount of warm water and honey to make a reddish jelly. The meal mixed with corn flour was fried in bear's grease to make hotcakes or fritters. And the early settlers made root beer from the tubers combined with molasses and parched corn, which sarsaparilla is in the Smilax family also, if you know that one. So there's like a potato you could eat, to my point. And asparagus at the end. Does it have a flower? I've never seen a flower. I've had it in my yard for years. And Try eating this tip. Eat that tip. Eat that tip. It is so delicious. The deers love that too. I have seen a flower. Yeah, I've never seen a flower. Okay, here's one. You must have seen this one. Known as balsam apple or balsam pear or bitter melon, right? This one is actually being used successfully to treat HIV in like Trinidad and Jamaica. Yeah. The leafy part of it, uh, I think they drink it as tea. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, once it turns, you can eat it as a green. When it's green, it's safe. But once it turns orange, it's poisonous. And, um, but the part that you can eat once it turns orange is you can suck on these little red seeds if you want. And the part around the seed is edible, but the seed itself is not, but I don't know, maybe it tastes good. I actually haven't tried that myself. So um, in this book, there's also a poisonous section. 
So sometimes plants have poisonous parts, but they're also edible in different other areas. So this particular one, you know, you have the book, it's on page 83. But um, so anyway, this, well, this one has been used for, successfully for diabetes as well in the tea form. Um, and it's the leaves again, but um, it even is growing as far north as Connecticut, but the vines and leaves are used to make a tea for aiding and healing cancer. In Jamaica, they just grab the vine, the leaves and vine, no fruit, wrap it around their forearm a couple of times and throw it in a pot to simmer. That's how they collect it. So um, it is one of the most widely used medicinal plants in the tropics, as I mentioned, um, very successful against HIV down there. It's anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, anti-inflammation, antivirus, has cholesterol lowering effects, lowering effects. Um, so that's a that's an important one. We have, you know, we see that all over the place here. Okay, wood sorrel. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but this is one of my son's favorites to eat because it tastes like lemon. It's easy to recognize, you know, it looks like a four-leaf clover, but it doesn't have four leaves, it has three. Um, but it's, if you've never tried it, just pick it in the yard and it tastes like lemons. And you can even make a wood sorrel lemonade tea out of it. Um, and there's different, there's sheep sorrel too, which has a slightly different looking leaf. But um, the sheep sorrel, I remember eating that as a child myself. Um, so that's again a boy scout. That was his one of his favorite ones. Very high in vitamin C. Any of these sour ones are high in vitamin C. You can also make wood sorrel cream sauce, you know, adding sour cream to it, like put on fish or something. You can make sorrel omelets. Um, medicinally, the fresh leaves make a poultice that you can use for cancers, old sores and ulcers. The leaves can be chewed to help with nausea, mouth sores and sore throats. The leaf tea, again, is good for scurvy because anything with high in vitamin C is good for scurvy, urinary infections and fevers, and also helpful for heartburn. So the um, sheep sorrel is the famous cancer remedy known as Essiac. It's sheep sorrel, turkey rhubarb, and um, one other ingredient, which spells Cassie backwards, the name of the, I think it was a nurse who actually invented that, but Essiac is her name spelled backwards. So wild grapes, I don't know if you've ever tried drinking the water out of a wild grape vine, but it is pure, clean water. If you have to get the vine pretty thick, like, you know, this thick, you can see, like the size of a quarter, but just cut it and water will come gushing out like, like a hose, basically. The, the diameter of a hose. So most times people just have the skinny vines, but if you have a thicker one, like that picture shows, um, know that there's water in there. And of course, the grapes are edible. I don't know if you've ever tried them, but they're delicious. Only the female plant produces the, the fruit, not the male. So if you have one and it's not producing fruit, it's because it's a male. And of course, grape leaves are famous for the um, Greek re recipes. Yeah, wild grape. It's under um, G, even though it's wild grape. I think I can still put it under G in the front. I have one of early, early days. No. Um, so this one should be under, like I said, G, which is, and uh, you can eat the leaves raw also. And again, you want to know what you can use for water. So um, the roots are poisonous though. Not every part of an edible plant is edible. Okay, sable palm. If you didn't know, in Florida, we have a famous swamp cabbage festival every year. Okay, has anybody been to that? All right. <laughs> I haven't even been to it. Um, but yeah, the heart of the palm in the terminal and where all those fronds come together, that's where the heart is. And I'm sure you've seen them in the grocery store even. But um, the berries are also edible. Has anyone eaten the berries? They taste delicious. You gotta wait for them to be purple or like almost black, not green. Have you had any uh, knowledge or experience with how any of these herbs can affect 
some of the issues with COVID. Well, like I was saying, the pine needle tea, people were definitely using that as a like a like an antidote for the spike proteins in the vaccine. That uh, some people were getting a lot of side effects, and it was helpful for that. Um, I'm saying my respiratory formula would be the thing I would be using a lot of if I had COVID. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point out you can eat the berries. You have to be kind of high up, like on a boardwalk or something to reach that. And of course, the sable palm is our state tree. Okay. Same thing with soft palmetto. Many people don't know there's a heart of palm in the soft palmetto eater, which is actually easier to access. And they say it tastes even better. And um, the berries, the soft palmetto berries are famous for prostate um, inflammation, but um, Jonathan Dickinson, which we have a state park, you know, further south, in 1699, he was captured by the Native Americans on the East Coast there, and all of them lived to tell the tale of what happened to them, and he wrote a journal about it, and they were given these salt palmetto berries. They were eating them by the basketful, like, like just handfuls they were eating them, and so they gave Jonathan Dickinson and his family some to eat and they said they gave us some of their berries to eat we tasted them but not one amongst us could suffer them to stay in our mouths for we could compare the taste of them to nothing else but rotten cheese steeped in tobacco juice <laughs> and they just couldn't get over how could they like these but by the end of their time in captivity they actually craved them themselves so it, it was an acquired thing that their body, not just their taste buds, but their body began recognizing the nutrition in it. And like I said, when you're fasting or starving, things start to taste better too. So, um, but yeah, even the palm fronds, you know how um, artichoke leaves there's at the base, you can like scrape off some meat. Same thing with these palm fronds, like at the base. And um the Boy Scouts could not wait to try tasting these, and I have them on video tasting them. They, they just couldn't, even though I read that line to them, they could not wait to taste them. They won't eat vegetables on their plates, but they couldn't wait. And the native, the pioneers in South Florida actually made a drink out of the juice of the palmetto berries mixed with carbonated water, and they sold it as a soft drink called Meadow, M-E-T-T-O, like short for palmetto. So that's like a soda for them something kind of with carbonated water. All right, so sea grapes, of course, are delicious. If you haven't tried those, when they get like, you know, purple like that, not green, but they're very sweet. They're like mildly, you know, they're not like tart. Um, they're absolutely delicious, but they're usually full of tiny little, potentially insects. So just make sure you look at it before you put it in your mouth. But there, it's, it's a great thing. You know, if you're here in Florida and you're starving, I'm trying to find what you can eat. All right, so air potatoes, this is one that confuses a lot of people because they, they look like they should be edible. And the roots are the part that's edible, not that tuber in the air, which is the aerial bulber, which is why they're called air potato. But there's actually two types um, and they, there, in the book, there's a picture of the one that the one that's edible has like more of this, this shape, not just a round bowl, but it's the root, not the area part. And you have to cook it. You have to cook the poison out of it. So, um, but there are there's a Cuban person in here that claims I'm Cuban and I've always eaten it and still do. What I also know and read is not to eat the one hanging off the vines, but the ones underground, but he, because they say the Florida ones are not, don't really have a root for some reason. Um, it's hard to find a big root in Florida, but the roots can be made into hash browns and like to things you would do with a potato. So it's widely consumed in the world as a yam species though, like sweet potatoes or yams. And it's even used the way they use um, yams to make hormone therapies um because hormones are like yams have a similar phyto hormone as females do and they use it for other things which are in here which i'm not going to get into but you have to be very careful with that just know it's a root not the material 
Okay, this one, I just wanted to throw in a point this morning. You haven't seen rosary pea, which is named after the women who were making rosary bead necklaces with them. And they were stringing them with the needles and the, the juice was getting in under their skin, which is a hundred times more poisonous than if they were to chew it and swallow it. Um, so they were dying, you know, making their necklaces. And it's a very painful death, um, you know, seizures and uh, throwing up and diarrhea and all that good stuff. But has anyone seen the Blue Lagoon movie? Yeah. The Blue Lagoon. Okay, so it's Christopher Atkins and Brooke Shields, who actually lived across from Maine when I was a baby. We were the same exact age, I guess. But um, in that movie, if you remember, they were stranded on an island and they had a baby together. And then at one point, the baby grabbed something in the bushes, which they actually freeze the, the, the movie to let you really look at it. And I did bring some here because you haven't seen it in person. But the baby had this in its hand and they were calling it sleep forever. Um, so, you know, it grows like, like the picture shows. But um, they were calling it sleep forever. And the baby was like in a, you know, sedated looking coma-like sleep. But at the end, when they didn't think they were going to get rescued, and they were all on the boat, and they were out in the ocean for a long time, many days, Brooke Shields and Christopher Atkins also were like, they opened the baby's hand and it was still clutching them. So then they each ate one. And just when, after they did that, the boat came to rescue them. So <laughs> I'm sure that they pumped their stomach or something and they survived. Right. <laughs> no, I'm sure they survived. It was like right after they did it, but they were so desperate. You know, like I just tell anybody if, um, you know, some people have come to me and saying, what could I do? If, you know, they know they're going to die and they don't want to go through whatever that's going to be like. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to suggest anything, but here's my book. You know, you, you figure it out because the Native Americans wanted to know what, plants that are poisonous could be used as an emetic to make them throw up, like if they did eat something poisonous, even though the plant making them throw up is kind of poisonous, but they needed to know which ones they could they could rely on to cause them to throw up. But I heard though that if you crack the seed with your teeth, that was enough to kill you. Yeah, I'm not talking about this one, okay. the, the making okay. to throw up. Okay. You would want to use a different one to make yourself throw okay. up. Okay. But yeah, um, like a baby, I mean, a, a child, one seed would kill them. But if you don't chew it and it right. goes through whole, you're probably okay. But if it gets under the skin, then it's toxic. Well, if you, you don't need the notes. They're in here. You don't need the notes. So my other book is 45 because that's 20 years of research. It actually saves me an hour of explaining. This, I'm going to go get more money. All right, well, thank you all for having me. And if you ever want, you want me to finish the other half of the call? I will forward it.